to have Carl Marlantes here with us to discuss his powerful new novel, Matterhorn, which is just an amazing book. John, our manager, had read this book earlier, and he can't, couldn't stop telling us all about it. Marlantes is a highly decorated Marine veteran who has been writing his epic war novel for the last 30 years. He's a graduate of Yale and a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford University who served in Vietnam, where he was awarded the Navy Cross, the Bronze Star, two Navy Commendation Medals for Valor, two Purple Hearts, and ten Air Medals. The book is really amazing, and all the more so because it's, it is Marlante's first novel. I'm going to read a couple of quotes. It was um, hard to choose things to read because there were so many rave reviews of this book. Um, there was an NPR review that said, I've laughed at Catch-22 and wept at the thin red line, but I have never encountered a war novel as stark, honest, and wrenching as Matterhorn. By turns, this book horrified me, crushed me, and beat me up, but I found it nearly impossible to stop reading. More than any living American novelist I've read, Marlantes made me feel what I'd already must have known, that war is worse than hell. And then, um, here's another that had said, he throws us into the jungle with these brave fighters, most of them teenagers, who will become men or die as the story unfolds. And then a number of the reviews have said that this is an epic war novel in the tradition of the naked and the dead and all quiet on the Western Front. Doug Stanton, the author of Horse Soldiers, says of the book, Matterhorn is a masterful and thrilling drama about an event of national importance that we have barely understood. The men and women of the story have long deserved a homecoming, and we need to hear their true story. Marlantes has written a timeless work of literary fiction. It's my honor to introduce Carl Marlantes. Well, thank you very much. Is, is this working for the... Mike, um, thanks for this wonderful introduction and for showing up here. And it's nice to see everybody. Um, I'm I'm always asked about that. You know, 30 years to publish this book. How did you manage to do that? And uh, it's it it is it's one of those stories that you can spin it either way. Uh, you, you know, it was 30 years of hardship or 30 years of thank God it happened because I didn't get you know it's that. Be careful what you wish for because you might get it. Uh, if I'd published it when I wanted to, which was, I first tried to publish it in 1977, it wouldn't have been a third of the novel that it, that it is today, and I don't mean in length, because um, it just took me 30 years to grow up to the point where my characters could actually, you know, have some depth that, that, that I understood about them. And um, I actually came back from the war and uh, I was going to write the great American novel. I mean, I, I had always written and, you know, short stories. And when I was nine years old, my cousin and I wrote a Space Invader novel where, where two nine-year-olds saved the world. I mean, it was sort of it's odd how that happened. Um, and uh, so I was going to write the great American novel, and I sat down at a typewriter, uh, an Olympic, and uh, madly typed out you hold on to your seat, 1,700 pages of, but it was A4, which is a little smaller than our, our paper, because I was over in Europe, and uh, double spaced, and, and I thought, yes, and then I finished it, and I went back to read it, and it was, it was clearly psychotherapy. It was not, not fiction, and I was in first person, and, you know, five pages about wet socks, and so then I thought I better get serious about fiction, and I started reading books. And you know they sell them here, and there's a lot of good ones. You know how to develop characters, and and uh, how to um, uh, you know structure plots. And uh, and I actually started reading the greats with a different eye. I mean you know you, you read you know someone like Tolstoy, and you just get into the book and you finish it, and then then it's like, oh that's a good book. And but but when you're trying to become a writer, you go like. How did this guy in one sentence create a character out of a horse? You know, I mean, and he does. I mean, you know, the, he, his horses are different than anybody, any other horses on the planet. And he, and he does it in a sentence or two. And so I'm going like, so you start doing this, how did he do it? So I came up with a central metaphor of the, of the novel, which is Matterhorn. It's the name of a fire support base, which in the beginning is just a, a very tall hill in the very far west of uh, where the Laotian border met what was then the DMZ. And it, the Marines turn it into a fire support base, uh, build bunkers, 
they're ordered off on a long circular journey. I mean, circular journeys are always part of novels. And uh, they are then have to reassault because the North Vietnamese Army occupies those bunkers. They assault the bunkers at considerable cost, and then they abandon them. Uh, and to me, it was sort of a metaphor for the war. And I didn't try to write a, um, a political book at all. I, I just tried to write a real book. And one of the realities is that there was no strategy there that made any sense. And, and this is the central uh, metaphor of that particular issue. So 1977, I'm trying to get this thing published. And it was like, uh, you know, first of all, I don't think Americans like to lose wars. And so that's a, <laughs> that was not handy. And, and I was like, we can't sell this. There's no, you know, no one's interested. And then I, after about 20 or 25, I don't know how many, I finally got discouraged and quit trying to sell it. And uh, no one would read it. So it wasn't rejected. Just my, just my query letters were rejected. Uh, mid 80s, I tried again and, um, Oh, yeah, there's no market. Hollywood's done it. Yeah, you know, full metal jacket and, you know, uh, platoon, and we couldn't sell this. And then by the mid-90s, I went, made another go at it. I mean, I had to go back, and I have five kids, and so, you know, there's a lot of teeth to straighten. And uh, <laughs> you don't do it writing novels, especially ones that no one will read. And uh, so I, I uh, then it was like, well, maybe you could set it in the Gulf War. I don't think I can. I wasn't there. And, and then... <laughs> Literally, I mean, I had two people write, I mean, if you can believe they actually put it on paper. You know, it's got this mountain in it, right? And we're in Afghanistan. There's lots of mountains in Afghanistan. Why don't, why don't you just move it to Afghanistan? I think we could probably make a, make a go of this book. And I don't know anything about Afghanistan either. And so finally, after all my uh, attempts at uh, more books, you know, how to write the killer query letter. You know, some of you are authors. You'll know these, these books. Um, Find the agent who will sell your book for you. Uh, I didn't, it didn't take because I kept writing and no one, no one, no one would ever read it. And so finally, uh, totally outside of my uh, desires, I, I, a friend of mine had, a ma had the manuscript and an old friend of his called up. He'd gone to school at Berkeley with him. Chat, chat, what are you doing? And his old friend, a guy named Tom Farber, said, well, he's, he's, he's a professor of, of writing at Berkeley. He said, well, he started a little nonprofit uh, uh, literary house, a publishing house that is gets grants so that they can get fine photography and fine literature into uh, print, so it can get into the marketplace. And then at least the the authors would have a chance because they'd actually have a book in their hands that they could go to New York, which is where you have to go, to uh, to try and get it into into uh, the the wider reading public. And so my friend says, "Well, I got this manuscript. It's pretty good." And I could just, I can still feel Farber's eyes rolling. I mean, everybody's got a friend with a manuscript if you're a publisher, you know. Um, and he's, so he got the monkey off of his back. He said, well, have him send it to my senior editor, Kit Duane, and she'll read it. And uh, so Ken calls me on the phone, you know, ah, send, this, send your manuscript down to Kit Duane. And I said, Ken, you know, it's going to cost me 50 bucks at Kinko's to copy this thing. And it's about Marines in Vietnam. And you want me to send it to a woman in Berkeley, California? <laughs> I'm not real good at business, but I knew that much, you know. And he shamed me. He said, uh, I'll pay for the copying. And I said, OK, OK, I'll do it myself. I'll copy it. And I, she loved the book. <clears throat> and what was really I didn't expect is that women have been the ones that have really got this book published. Um, the next step was my wife, who said, you know, no, I mean, I, kept, I went back now, then I had a, I had a paper bound, which, which uh, there's about 300 of them out there someplace, because uh, the, the, the pub date passed just before Grove Atlantic got a hold of it. And um, <clears throat> she said, no one will read it, right? Because I, I was back to the query letters. And she said, well, why don't you get Gro um, El Leon to submit it to some contests? Because if any, these people have any integrity at all, They'll have to read 10 or 15 pages of that book. And so we did, and we submitted it to, uh, among others, Barnes & Noble uh, Discovery, Discover Great New Writers program. And uh, they farm out these books to all their staff who volunteer to, to read them, obscure authors. And uh, a woman in uh, San Antonio, Texas, loved this book. And she sent it to her boss, Jill Lamar who's in New York, and she loved this book, and she sent it to her boss, 
a woman named Cecily Hensley, and, and Cecily immediately knew that if Barnes & Noble selected it, this little house in Berkeley would just be overwhelmed. And, uh, and I can remember this, this started getting excited. They kept asking for more books, and Tom told me, and I said, Tom, what happens if we win? And he said, I don't know. You got any money? <laughs> And she knew that. And so what she did then is she took it to uh, several of her friends who are publishers. And one of them was Morgan Intrican from Grove Atlantic. And he read about half of the book and uh, called Farber on the phone and said that he wanted to publish it. And that was, that's the story of how it got published uh, eventually. Um, and that's, that's how I ended up being here in front of you. So. I thought that what I'd do tonight is I'll, I'll read um, a passage and, and uh, then just open it up because uh, people have a lot of questions and, and uh, just, just let the questions uh, fly after the passage and, and then we'll stop about 8 o'clock and uh, just start signing books. And uh, I found if I open with the, this particular scene, it kind of gets those of us who are of a certain age back into that, that time period. Um, the the uh, protagonist of the novel is a 21-year-old uh, second lieutenant named Wayne O'Mellis. And I heard someone talking, yes, it's from Wainamoinen, which is a Finnish name. And, uh, uh, and uh, he has a 19-year-old radio operator named Hamilton. And it's the middle of the night. And it's hard for people who are raised mostly in urban areas to know how black it can get in a jungle or forest at night when there's cloud cover. You cannot see a thing and the person can be right next to you. You can feel their body heat or you can smell their breath, but you can't see them in this far away. And so they're huddled together. And like most kids that are, you know, a, a little bit frightened and, and lonesome uh, and they start talking about their girlfriends and back home. And it, uh, uh, triggers a, a memory in, in Mellis about when he left his, his uh, girlfriend or when she left him. He remembered the night Anne told him that she couldn't go along with this weird concept of morality that he'd come up with about keeping his promise to the president. It had started as a wonderful meal in the New York apartment that Anne shared with two of her friends from Bryn Mawr, both of whom had made themselves discreetly absent. Anne had gone all out, not only with the bacon-wrapped chicken livers and water chestnuts, but with real French press coffee from a real French press coffee pot that she'd brought home from her junior summer in Paris. Mellis had never seen one before. He thought that the best time to tell her about sending in his letter to the Marine Corps would be over coffee. There was no best time. Mellis found himself standing with an empty coffee pot in one hand and two empty mugs in the other, looking at her beautiful backside. She was wearing the salmon-colored miniskirt that emphasized her small waist and hugged her bottom, the one that she knew drove him wild. You don't even like the president, she said. Exasperated, she whirled back to face the sink of dirty dishes. You told me yourself that he's just a manufactured image. It's not like making a promise to a person. Yeah, but he's the president. American presidents don't lie to Americans. He felt foolish talking to her back. He's like the representation of, I don't know, of, of the Constitution, for Christ's sakes. I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States I raised my hand and I swore, so help me God. She twisted around, her hand still on the edge of the sink. You were a high school kid, you were 17. I was still me. She turned back, oh God, she said to the wall. He looked dumbly at the pot and cups in his hand. Why was she mad at him? It was a sacred oath, and two of the guys he'd gone through training with at Quantico were already dead. Bueno, she said, still looking at the wall. Johnny Hartman got his doctor to say that knee he hurt in football would go out all the time. Jane's brother got his doctor to say that he was gay. He said nothing. She let out a long sigh. Her shoulders moved just that little bit back down to where they normally sat. He realized that she'd been holding her breath. She went into her quiet voice. 
the one that he knew there was no arguing against. You got into law school. You were deferred. In three years, the war could be over, and if it isn't, you'll do your time as a lawyer. People would kill to get to where you are. People are getting killed. Better people than Johnny Hartman and Jane's brother. She turned, this time slowly. She was trembling. The tears welling from her green eyes struck him dumb and made him feel guilty. Yes, she hissed. Yes, yes, yes. And you sent in the letter without even talking to me about it. You didn't even think to talk to me about it. A month after that, he was at the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. He found it difficult to write to her, knowing that marine training was totally foreign to her. She responded infrequently, saying that her new career kept her busy. Once, after he'd been in Quantico nearly three months, he called her to say that he could get up to New York on a three-day pass. She said that she'd already planned something in Vermont. Two months after that, he had his orders to Vietnam. He called her and said he had to see her before he shipped out. She said okay, but warned him not to plan on spending the night. Beefed up from the training, hair cut to the skull and in the uniform of a Marine second lieutenant, he made the long train ride from Virginia to New York. When he got to her apartment, her roommates told him that she was out on a date. He waited awkwardly, knowing that her roommates were trying to entertain him. Finally, they went to bed. When she got home, she made tea. After an awkward half hour, she told him he could sleep on the couch, and she went to bed. He'd been so frightened and desperately in need of comfort that he crawled into bed with her anyway. After two uncomfortable hours with her back to him, he gave up on sleep. He got up in the dark, struggled into his uniform in the overheated apartment, the wool sticking to the sweat on his body. She watched him silently. He called a cab and packed his vow pack. When he was folding it together on the floor, he looked up to see her sitting on the side of the bed. She was wearing a long man's shirt. It didn't hide her panties. Apparently, she didn't care. When's your plane? 0530. He wished that he hadn't slipped into military time. You hungry? He stood up, pulled the vow pack upright, and lifted it. No. Well, yeah. He couldn't take his eyes off of her. He never could. Bye. Bye. He walked out the door, closing it quietly so he wouldn't disturb her roommates, and went down the stairs. The cab was pulling up when he heard her running barefoot down the street, still in her long shirt. He stood there, paralyzed. She reached him, eyes brimming with tears, and gave him a hug and a quick kiss, and then pulled back. The cabbie had picked up his vow pack and was back behind the wheel, giving them some time. Anne sat down on the curb. Go on, she said softly, looking across the empty street. Go. His last view of her was through the rear window of the cab. She was sitting on the dirty curb, bent over, her hands wedged between her face and her knees, shaking with sobs. When they pulled out a side of her, the cabbie asked, not unkindly, going to Vietnam? Yeah, tough goodbye. The end of that. The only thing I left out of the scene was the Matus bottle with the wax dripping down the side. <laughs> <laughs> Every everybody had one of those. <laughs> Did that scene come from real life? Part of it came from real life, and and part of it came from stories, the uh, dear John stories. That, you know, a lot of that happened. I mean, it's hard to remember how contentious this whole thing was, and there were a lot of even in families got broken up, not just boyfriends and girlfriends. It was it was a very difficult time. Yeah. <clears throat> what years were you there before you went? I was there in uh, 1968 and 69, and I was with uh, the 4th Marines. Uh, we were in uh, Quang Tri Province, like I, I said. I and, and what the novel is set in is the, the, the country I knew, which was in the mountains uh, right along the Laotian borders where we were. 
Yeah. Uh, in the book, uh, your protagonist uh, initially has a uh, sort of negative view of the uh, officers that are running the war from the farm. Looking at the chain of command seems to just respect for the person that's higher above the person that's higher. A at the end, uh, he seems to sort of reverse that conclusion. Is that your feeling too, uh, having served the tour and then come back? Well, no, I, I, um, I don't think that he reversed his conclusion about the two particular officers that, that were plaguing this company. Um, Simpson and Blakely, um, but he he did start to see. I mean, remember at the mess night there was you know a guy who said, "Well, I thought you were a lifer," and the guy said, "Yeah, but I'm not stupid." And he began he's beginning to learn that it, it, we're dealing with people here, and and uh, it my villains, which are those two, and uh, and people say we well, always you took the, the a brass to task. I said, "No, Mulvaney." Is, is a very solid guy, you know, and, he, and he's frustrated because he can't, he can't seem to be effective in leading the way he wants because of the nature of the war. But these people, Blakely and, and Simpson, and even some of the characters like Cassidy, um, they're not evil people. They're ordinary people, and they have the same foibles that everybody in this room has. One of them drinks a little too much. One of them is a little more ambitious than maybe he ought to be. Sometimes they get lazy and, and a little hazy and forget a little detail. And what I, I wanted to show is that, you, if, you know, if you work for the school district, well, maybe someone gets promoted unfairly. Or if you're a big corporation, you have these problems, maybe two cents per share is not there at the end of the quarter. No one will know anyway. But if you're in a war, these ordinary human foibles kill people. And that's why we have to hold such incredible, impeccable standards for people who are in positions of power like that. And that went right up to the President and the Secretary of Defense. Um, I think that they made the mistakes. I mean, I watched the Robert McNamara documentary. I think he was genuinely remorseful. And when I think, what was it that, that caused him not to say in 1965 that he thinks the war was going to be lost, is that he didn't want to look dumb. I don't want to look dumb either, but luckily I'm not the Secretary of Defense. You can't afford that, you know. And Johnson, Johnson didn't want to, you know, be the first president to lose a war or be pushed around by that little piss ant up in North Vietnam. You know, uh, that's just pride. And uh, you know, read the Seven Deadly Sins. Or the, yeah, the, the Seven Deadly Sins. It's a pretty good list, actually. <laughs> so that's my that's my take. And what Mellis starts to learn is that he has to deal with that in an adult manner. Yeah. What was your rank when you left the service? Well, I was a, a lieutenant when I left the service. I was a, a first lieutenant. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you read about uh, other histories of war and found similarities or um, that Vietnam stands out in any way? I just have read, you know, World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that, you know, the question was, you know, basically, did I see anything different about Vietnam from other wars that have been fought? And yes, I, I, I think I do. Um, up until that point, we more or less knew what the objective was. Beat the Kaiser. Uh, eliminate fascism. Now, my father's a World War II veteran, and he said nobody thought about that when they were fighting. I mean, it was just all about your friends, and that, that never changes. Um, there's a new book out by Sebastian Younger. He's with a, a group of paratroopers in Afghanistan. It's identical. Only the technology changes. I mean, Genghis Khan and Agamemnon, you know, had these same issues. But what's happened is that in my opinion, but since I'm behind the pulpit, I get to say it. You know. I mean, what do I know? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not in Washington, D.C., but 
Is what once, and well, well <laughs> it, was, it was described to me once as 28 square miles surrounded by reality, but uh, yeah. um, it's, we, we, are, we have gotten confused between the role of warriors and the role of policemen. And warriors choose sides, my side, their side, the enemy, the people I protect. I'm not a pacifist. I'm not a long way from it. And um, they're willing to risk death and maiming to protect their side, and they'll use violence to do it. That's a warrior. A policeman is only chooses the law if he's good. He doesn't choose sides. He's indifferent. But what do you need if you have the law? I'll bet you could go to the state pen in any state in this country, and you could ask the people who are in there what the law is, and they'll know what it is, and they'll agree with it. It's bad to steal. They just thought they'd get away with it this time. We're going into countries trying to, act, trying to be sort of like, you know, keep the peace, trying to sort of be, sort out, you know, uh, situations that, that people don't even agree on what the law is. And we are, we're, we're putting ourselves in the middle of situations where they're trying to determine that. Is it going to be Sharia law or is it going to be Western, whatever we call it, court, what do we call our law? Non-Sharia law. <laughs> uh, is it going to be communism or whatever the South was practicing? They haven't agreed yet. And uh, there we are. And I think that's a very different type of situation than up until probably Korea, where it was like, well, throw them out of South Korea. They came across the border. Um, the first Gulf War was more along the lines of a, an actual, we know what we're doing here. Get them out of Kuwait. Uh, and, and because the Kuwaitis agreed with us. But when we start intervening in these places where, where it's not decided yet, I think that we're finding ourselves in over our heads. Um, <laughs> you know, that's my view. <laughs> you know. Did your father get to read your book? Uh, no, you know, it, it's, it's kind of sad, but my mom and dad both died before, um, before it got published just about t three years ago. And um, yeah, and they, they never did. Um, um, but it's the breaks. Your yeah. wife? Well, uh, yeah, she read it. Did you ever get tired of waiting for you to get a public? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had, I've had one marriage earlier than, than, than my current one, and she did get tired of waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but my current wife's been very patient about it. You know. She was the one that came up, like I said, she's the one that got it published with that idea of hers. Uh, sure. Talk about Tolstoy. Talk about reading him. Were there other authors that you read? When you were oh yeah, yeah. People often wonder. I mean, um, I've been most influenced in in my my writing by uh, Tolstoy is one of is one of my favorite authors, and and I really think he's just well head and shoulders above the normal writer who's really great. Um, I was quite influenced by the World War One poets. Uh, Sassoon, uh, Wilfred Owen, uh, Robert Graves. Um, <clears throat> there's some others, Rosenberg, that, that are very important to me because they were the first ones that began to break through this, um, I don't know what the word is, sort of uh, uh, everybody, um, I can't have a word for it, and being in lockstep, you know. They are the first ones that went, well, started to look at it a little bit askance and say, whoa, what are we doing here, really? And uh, there's a particular book by a guy named David Jones, who oddly enough is a Welshman, and he used a lot of Welsh mythology in his book. It's called In Parentheses, and it's, it's almost poetry. It's that thick, but it's full of these images of, of Welsh mythology, and, and this novel has an awful lot of, of uh, uh, Celtic mythology in it as well. And then Thin Red Line, uh, Naked and the Dead, uh, those, were, those were important books too. What about the Red Badge of Courage? Carl? I, I read the Red Badge of Courage, and um, you know, I, I read it in high school when everybody else read it, <laughs> and uh, um, I thought it was a good book. But for some reason, it's not one that, that 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 just that I haven't gone back to reread it, and I don't know why. I mean, obviously, it's a classic, you know. But I read it. You know. Carl, um, in the last year or two, uh, Nightline did a show on. Of men who had died and men and women who died in the um, Middle East, and all they did was run a list of their names and pictures and their rank and their age. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
HBO did a documentary, I think it was called First First Day, about in which they interviewed uh, soldiers that had been severely wounded in, um, I think it was Iraq. Um, you told a story about being on the train, and uh, mm -hmm. there weren't really favorable depictions of American soldiers back in 1965, 66, 68, 69. I wonder what that was like for you being, you know, dealing with the enemy over there and kind of being seen as somewhat of the enemy in this country until probably 1977. <laughs> mm. Yeah, the question was what, is it, what was it like to be fighting the enemy over there and then being viewed when we came back as, as the enemy over here. Um, I can only say it was traumatic. Uh, I mean, you thought you came home to a safe place and it was like, it's not safe. I mean. One friend of mine who got out at El Toro, he was so anxious to hitchhike home to Santa Barbara, he went right out on the highway in, in his uniform and stuck his thumb out and the car pulled up and he ran up to the car and the kids came out and threw beer cans at him, you know, and hit him and with full beer cans. And it was like, he was just, he, he's, he's never gotten over it. And it, it was very difficult. And I think that one of the things though that I'm trying to do, and it's been quite wonderful, is that I've had people I mean, I went to read in Berkeley, and I was I was nervous because I mean they're still you know got the pink ladies or whatever their names are you know picketing the the Marine Corps recruiting station there, and I thought oh dear, but and there was a packed room, but the feeling in the room was basically us you know baby boomers generation trying to figure out what in the hell happened, how did we behave? I mean, we went over there and fought, and those of us who are veterans came home to this horrible reception. And are we going to just carry the anger of that for 40 years? Is gonna, are we going to be like the Civil War generation? We're going to just finally have to all die before this damn thing gets healed? And the other people in the room were going like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why I did that. And the answer is, we were all kids. That's why we did it. We didn't know better. And you're so unconscious that I really, it's in the book, I call it the mad monkey. Um, we are not the top planet, a top, top animal on this planet because we're nice. I mean, you know, oh, let's share the planet with the monkeys and the whales. Uh-uh, sorry. We're, we're, we're the top animal because we have a really mean, vicious side to us. Now, civilization tries very hard to keep that, keep that in check. But the very thing that the protesters were protesting about, you know, violence and viciousness, got projected onto the, 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 the veterans coming home. Not out of any, um, that's just kids. I mean, it, 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 everything's black and white. I mean, you know, and, and uh, of course this is evil, and of course that's good. And it's amazing how, you know, <laughs> get beat up by life for three more decades, you begin to see it's not really black and white anymore. So that's, um, anyway, that's, that's, that's sort of how I feel about the, the coming home, which is, it was horrible, but, I'm kind of over it. Is there another passage you'd like to read to us? Yeah, I, I could if you want to hear another passage. I'd love to. All right. Um, let me think. Uh, I could set, set this one up. Um, there's a, a, a character in the, in the novel, his name is Cortell, and he's a black kid from Mississippi, and he is a very strong Christian, and he takes a lot of guff about it because he's, uh, uh, you know, he's right up front about his Christianity, and of course everybody calls him the preacher and makes fun of him, but he, he gives it all, he gives as good as he gets. And there's another black kid from Compton named Parker, and uh, I'm sorry it takes so long to set this up, but Parker was, was shaved uh, bald in front of the whole company because he, he wanted to grow an afro, and, and the, the, the sergeants just disagreed with him. And, he, and uh, so they shaved him bald in front of the whole company and humiliated him. So he decided to retaliate by rigging a, a hand grenade. You can, hand grenades have pins on them, and they're like, just like cotter pins. And if you pull them back and, and people hang them from their pins, which they often would do, you're not supposed to for this reason, then, then that, that, the weight of the grenade would just pull off the cotter pin and it would blow up and it would look like an accident. And he rigged one of, one of these sergeant's grenades, but the, but the sergeant found it out. And then he's, he's come down with a, a, a very virulent strain of malaria. They're in a river canyon. There's no way that they can get a medevac. It's pitch black. It's um, uh, fog down to the ground. 
he's got a temperature of up to 106 and the, the medics who are 19 year old kids too, they don't know what to do with this. And uh, Mellis figures out that there's a wide spot in the, down in the river that might get underneath the fog that they might get a chopper in to get him out. And that's where, where this uh, takes up. Mellis's mind raced. Here above the canyon, they were in a jungle with 200-foot trees and fog came right to the ground. The canyon had narrowed considerably since Parker's first episode, but it had been clear of fog. It seemed the only choice. He remembered a wide spot just before Kendall took them off the river and he radioed Fitch. Ten minutes later, Vancouver was leading the way down to the river. Parker and Challen, the kid from Kendall's platoon, were both slung in ponchos. Parker kept moaning, so they stuffed part of his shirt in his mouth. Mellis and Vancouver emerged from the jungle onto the canyon rim somewhat ahead of the rest. They were a good 40 feet above the river. Mellis's heart sank. Was the flat area upstream or down? He looked at his watch. Daylight in another hour. It had taken them two hours to make it to the river. He knew he was close, but what if he wasn't? They could be trapped in the river in the dark and moving in the wrong direction, and they'd lose both Parker and Challen. It was his call. He huddled over his map, hiding the dim red glow of his flashlight. The breeze made his back cold. He squinted into the dark, trying to identify any terrain feature that would help him make the right choice. There was a loud groan and a sound of falling rocks as the litter bearers emerged from the jungle. Jackson came up to him. Doc says we gotta cool Parker off quick, sir. Parker ain't even making sense anymore. Get the rope, Mel, I said. We'll take him over the edge right here. We've gotta be close to the spot. Here? Here, goddammit. Now get some security set up behind us. And so they set up security. Without being told, Vancouver wrapped the rope around his waist, walked out backward over the edge, and disappeared. Mellis crawled on his stomach, trying to watch Vancouver's descent in the dark. The rope slackened. Vancouver's voice floated up. It ain't bad, Lieutenant. We've even got some rock up out of the water. Three others went over the edge to set up security, two upstream and two down, and then they lowered Parker and Challen to the water. Soon only a very frightened Breuer and Tillman were left above to provide security where the rope was tied. Fredericks and the medic had Cortell undressed and, par and, had, and Cortell undressed Parker except for his boots, leaving only his head out of the water. Challen, his fever having suddenly abated, sat by the river's edge, shivering uncontrollably. One of the squad mates took off his flak jacket and wrapped his arms around Challen, trying to warm him. Mellis sent Vancouver and another kid upstream and Jackson and another down, and Jackson returned first. He'd found the wide spot. They lifted Parker to the litter and carried him downstream, whistling for Breuer and Tillman to come down the rope. Mellis told them to pull it down and wait there for Vancouver. Mellis slipped and fell in the water three times before they finally reached the wide place. They laid Parker on his back in the rocks. He was fully conscious the river flowing around him, cooling his body. Cortell knelt beside him. I've been scared before, Parker said, but I didn't think it'd be like this. You'll be okay. We'll get a bird in for you. Jesus be with you, brother. Parker looked up at the darkness above him. His eyes closed. Then he reached out, grabbing for anything. Cortell took his hand, squeezing it hard. I don't want to die here, Cortell. I don't want to die here. He started moaning softly. Mellis and Fredrickson looked on, the water running across the tops of their boots. Mellis's throat ached. He screwed up his eyes, forcing the tears back. He'd never watched anyone die before. It'll be okay, Parker, said Cortell. Brother, we just baptize you right here on the spot, and Jesus wash your sins away. I was going to kill the gunny. That's okay, Parker. So was I. You didn't. I rigged his grenade, but he must have found it. It was only luck I didn't kill him. That's okay. Cortell was slowly pouring water from his hands onto Parker's forehead. We call that grace. I know I should never have done it. That's why I got this fever. Parker rolled to his side, his elbow slipping on a loose rock beneath the water. 
He lunged for Cortell, who helped turn him on his back, cradling his head in the stream. He lay there and began sobbing. How can I go to hell, Cortell, forever? How can I? How can it be so fucking bad? Not like this. How can I go to hell? You ain't going to hell. That's where you've been. You just asked Jesus to forgive you. Cortell gently poured another handful of water onto Parker's head. I can't. Then I will. Cortell let a third handful of water drain onto Parker's head. He placed his helmet on Parker's stomach and then bent over the helmet, hands folded and closed his eyes. Lord Jesus, sweet Lord Jesus, you know this man, Duane Parker, who is about to come to thee. He has been a good man. He has seen some bad times. Now he asks you with all of his heart for you to forgive him so he might come to thee in thy glory. Lord Jesus, I know you hear me, even here in this river. Amen. Cortell took his helmet off Parker's stomach and placed it on his own head again. Then he put one hand on Parker's chest and moved it in a slow rhythm. You know my sister, Parker said, she's a cheerleader of her high school. She lives with our great aunt now. Parker was breathing rapidly. You tell her. You tell her I never much said anything nice to her, but I love her, huh? You tell her, Cortell. Sure. Don't worry, she know that. Cortell started singing a hymn. It was one that neither Fredrickson nor Mellis had ever heard. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground where all is peace. Mellis filled a hand with water for a drink, but he just looked at it and let the water drain from between his fingers. Then he covered his eyes with his palm, his wet fingers against his forehead to hide his tears. They waited there, looking east for the first light, listening for the sound of a chopper. Just before dawn, Parker went into convulsions and died as the three of them tried to keep him from drowning. Challand was still alive when the medevac bird came up the narrow gorge, fighting the erratic wind currents the rotor wash spraying water behind it like a hydroplane. It took out two bodies, not yet on the planet 20 years, one living and one dead. There's usually a pretty good silence after that one. <laughs> I know you went through a lot of revisions, but uh, having read the prior one, and there was quite a bit more detail in it, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about the evolution of the story as it has as come along? Um, yeah, the question is that he, he'd read the El Leon version, which is a uh, 23% bigger. Uh, I cut 23% from it. And it was, um, and I feel fine about it. Uh, Morgan Entrican, when he, when he made the deal with El Leon, told me, he, he said, you can, I'll publish it word for word if that's what you want. Then there was this little pause and a but. He said, if you want to sell it to more than, a, than just people who read a lot of literature, if you want a wider audience, you're going to have to uh, speed it up. And I struggled with my artistic integrity about 20 seconds, I think. <laughs> I said, okay, and it, and it was all up to me. I mean, he put a really great editor, Jofi Ferrari Adler, on it, who, <laughs> I mean, God, you don't ever want to have someone like, I mean, this is a, he, he wasn't even alive when this war was going on, and, and he's, he's doing stuff on the pages like, oh, God, please, speed this up. I can't stand it. <laughs> you know? But it was good, because I'd go like, well, you know, Jofi, this time I'm not going to cut this, but, yeah, I guess Jofi's right. And, and I, I even set up a little spreadsheet. I mean, I was kind of a nerd, you know, and every, I knew what my pace had to be. I kind of had set myself a goal of cutting 20% of it. And I just said, I'm going to do it. And what I gave up, I gave up a lot of dialogue. I, I would move stuff forward with narrative that had been moved by dialogue. And I gave up a lot of banter. Uh, th there's a lot of banter that goes on between guys when they're in hard s circumstances, but yeah, I, I had to give up some of that color and some of that banter. And uh, 
so that's, so I feel fine about it. I mean, I have to, it's all my, my work. I mean, you know, they, they set me up. It's up to you, Carl, you know, it's your book, you know. So I can't, I, Jopi said, you can blame me if you want, I can take it. And I said, no, I won't do it, because <laughs> it was up to me, yeah. There's a scene where, um, towards the end of the book, where Mellis does this amazing heroic piece, mm -hmm. goes up the hill. And I wondered if you had done something like that, because it's written so believably um, that I just, I thought, oh my God, he's done this. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I did get a Navy Cross for leading an assault up, up a hill, and, you know, if, if you're curious about that, it's, uh, I can't hide, it's on the internet, there's, you just Google Carl Marlantis Navy Cross, and, but he, you know, nothing's private anymore, <laughs> so, yeah, so, it's, yeah, that's true, I, I, that scene was, you know, like a lot of stuff, it's not exactly what happened to me, but I could write that scene because I had well, experienced something very, like very that. similar, yeah. Mellis is not me. People say, is that, are, you, are you Mellis? I mean, he's, he's very much a different character than I am. I mean, if I had half of his political talent, I mean, I'd own the town. I wouldn't just be here talking, you know, about my book. I, he, he's a very shrewd operator. He's a good politician. And I knew, and my older brother was like that. He was a corporate politician, not a public politician, but he could, he could, he knew people just zing, you know, I mean, it was amazing. And so he's in there. And a guy that I used to work with who was a kingmaker in Oregon, he, he, he never got his name in the paper, but nobody would move without this guy f having, pulling the strings. I mean, he was, he was remarkable and, and, and a good guy. And he, unfortunately, both of those people died of cancer at a fairly young age. And you go like, yeah, we had Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, can't you take them, you know? <laughs> Why my brother and this incredible, smart politician? But they're, they're who, who, constitute malice. And obviously there's me in him too. I mean, every character in here is me. I'm more like Cortell. I'm, I'm always thinking about the, the big picture, you know, and it's like, that's not a good thing to do if you're supposed to be in, in combat with a group of, group of Marines. <laughs> but that was, that's why I'm not a career Marine too. Um, uh, but every lieutenant that gets dropped into combat virtually experiences the same kind of stuff. They have to, they have to get it together very fast or they don't, they don't make it. You know, and they and, and and the same with with any you know private that's dropped into there, and so the experiences are the same. And one of the artistic issues that that I had to deal with is that the the military has stereotypical positions. I mean, if if you're 19 and you suddenly make sergeant, <clears throat> how are you going to behave? What's your models? Well, let's see. There's John Wayne. You know, I mean, me, I can behave like him. And then there's you know Sergeant Rock in the comic books then they start behaving like that. I mean, because they're kids and that's how they, that's what they think they can do. And so then you have a character who is, you know, if he's, well, he's just behaving like some cliche. Yes, but how to write it so that he wasn't a cliche and yet he was behaving that way is, I don't know if I succeeded or not, but it's, it, was, it was a difficult artistic issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you were there, were you thinking of writing no, I told you that, that I, had, I had written uh, ever since I was a kid, and, and uh, yeah, there, it occurred to me that if I ever get out of this alive, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expose the Marine Corps and I'm gonna write the great American novel. But, and uh, as you can tell, I have an enormous affection for the Marine Corps. I mean, I, I'm so proud to have been one, and, and, uh, but I saw it's, uh, like Mulvaney says, you know, there's hard times as well as glorious times. And, uh, I tried to see it straight, um, and then I came back with this with this idea of doing that book. But it was it was always just in the back of my head, sort of someday, someday I'm going to write it. And finally, I just started doing it. Sure. Another thing I wonder is this wonderful quotation that you have at the beginning, Wolfram von Eschenbach. What is all? Who was that? Did you read that? Oh yeah. Um, well, I'll read it, and then I'll, I'll explain why it's there. Shame and honor clash where the courage of a steadfast man is motley like a magpie. But such a man may yet make merry for heaven and hell have equal part in him. Wolfram von Eschenbach is a 13th century German poet who was a knight, and he wrote one of the great... Uh, poems about the Parseval myth, which is part of the Grail cycle. 
and um, uh, Mellis is Parsifal. And he's, he's both black and white. In fact, I, I chose the name because it means honey and darkness in Greek, sort of, if you mangle it together. And he's, he's both honey and darkness, and uh, just like all of us. And uh, the story of Parsifal is about a, a young man learning compassion. And what, uh, what happens is that he, he comes across the Fisher King, and he's been raised as a knight. And knights don't ask foolish questions. And you'll see that there's often that Mellis keeps his mouth shut when he, he should have asked a question. And he comes across the Fisher King who's wounded in the testicles with a lance and suffering horribly. And from there, the wasteland uh, issues because the male fecundity is stopped cold. And this is where T.S. Eliot m got the, the, the early myth mythological underpinnings of the wasteland. And there's a wonderful book called From Ritual to Romance by a woman named Jessie w Weston that uh, talks about this, the mythology behind all this myth mythology, um, uh, the grail myth and everything. And so Mellis ha is trying to learn compassion. That's his task. And Parsifal has a half-brother named Firfez who is half white and half black because his mother was Belcane, who was a, a Moor, which they considered black in Germany in the 12th and 13th century. And uh, so there's a, there's a great deal of that sort of way underneath it. Uh, the, the publicist at Grove said, don't you dare tell people about that. They'll think it's an intellectual book and they won't buy it. <laughs> but I think I'm safe in this audience here. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not going to, people say, are you going to, you know, what's happened? Is he going to do Mellis comes home? I said, no, I'm done. Uh, I'm done. Uh, the, the one I'm working on now is, uh, uh, I got very interested in Norse sagas. I'm half Scandinavian and half Greek. And uh, these Icelandic sagas from the 10th century, 11th century, about an immigrant people settling a land, which then was Iceland, and, uh, and thinking about the same sort of structure uh, of, of immigrants settling in the Northwest. And the protagonist of the novel is a woman named Aino, and uh, she is, believes that the collective answer is the answer to humans' problems, and she is, an, is a very fervent labor organizer in the logging camps. And she falls in love with a, a guy who just wants to have his own fishing boat and doesn't want to have anything to do with organizing anything. And, and it's the clash in our culture between the individualism and the collective that goes back and forth and back and forth. And hopefully someday we'll work it out because my own view is they're going to get married and it'll be, ah, symbolic, the, 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 the what do they call it, the Herios Gamos of the, uh, of the two conflicting sides. But that's... That's what the novel is basically structured around. Long answer. <laughs> Carl, yes. Do you ever have a thought like that when you're writing and, and suddenly your characters will not cooperate with you? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, uh, there were, I mean, there's characters that just, you know, pop up and, and suddenly it's like, wow, you know. It, and, but that's what's so fun about writing. Writing, the first draft, is ag it's, it's, like, it's like sort of uh, you get high because it, you, you're discovering stuff all the time. But unfortunately, that's about 10 or 15% of the work, because then you, you do edit and edit and edit and edit, and, you know, and by that time, the, but even then, the characters will muscle in and say, no, no, I, I, need, I need two more pages here. You know? and okay, you, know, you, you can feel it. You know. sure. What was it like returning to Oxford? <laughs> what was it like returning to Oxford? Yeah, I had this marvelous. Uh, I gave up my scholarship and I'm, I'm only half embarrassed to say I took the money. They give you money ahead of time. And so I took all the money and uh, went to Africa uh, because I was, had a girlfriend. She said I, she'd go to Sweden with me. But, but uh, I thought, geez, you know, because that would have been desertion at that point. And I thought, I can't do that. And I couldn't stay in Oxford because I just felt I was hiding behind privilege. I mean, friends of mine, we lost five from my high school. Five kids died from my high school, and I, one of them and two of them had already gone, and, and I just felt bad. And uh, so I said, well, I, I got to do something. It's either desert or go, because I was, well, I was a kid, black and white, you know. And I decided to send, to, to go, and uh, I thought, well, I'd blown it. And I spent three years thinking about all the things I wish I could have done at Oxford when I, <laughs> when I didn't have another chance. And I was still in the Marine Corps, and a letter came from the warden of Rhodes House, who was a World War II veteran. And he, 
He had been in Montgomery's Eighth Army in, the, in Africa and in Italy, and, and then actually had, had joined Montgomery's staff. And, and so he was, you know, had seen a lot of combat. And he wrote me this letter in little squiggy English handwriting. I think they have courses in how to write handwriting. It's big, you know. <laughs> Dear Mr. Marlantis, you know, it's, it's so glad to hear that you came back home alive. Full stop. Um, should you ever come to England and should you ever happen to visit Oxford and be walking up the high street, you will pass your old bank, Barclays, I believe. If you go in and inquire, you will find that the original amount that you took from it has been redeposited in your name. And I just burst into tears. And uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I was able to go back and get my scholarship again. And, and all this guy said to me, when I said, you know, thank you very much. He said, I don't want to hear anything about it. He says, I know how crazy it can get. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.